Okay, let's get started. Um, we are also going to post this up later on. So anyone that misses it now or doesn't get to join in, they'll be able to view this on our Facebook pages, our LinkedIn pages, and everything else um, from that point forward. Um, what I'd like to do to start out is just kind of go over our agenda. I have to share my screen, and I need to ask everyone if they can see my screen. Uh, the following person will be removed from the meeting when transcript starts. Uh, Brother Naeem Muhammad is telling me that it will start transcripting. It's going to kick you, and you'll have to come back in. This is what the meeting is telling me right now. So let me share my screen. Let's get it up and going. I want to see presentation mode here. We have a PowerPoint presentation. All right. I'm going to share my screen. PowerPoint. And please let me know that you can see my screen. Yes, yes, through. Okay. I'm going to go into full presentation mode, and I want to make sure that you still can see that. Can everybody still see the full presentation instead of the PowerPoint box then? You can see the full presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're here to talk about Kazakhstan. Of course, uh, my name is Brother Farouk Hunter. Um, I am the uh, managing director of Coastal Limited and uh, CEO of Genius Coastal Support Services inside of the United States. Um, we'll get into a little about Coastal. I want to, the first part of our series, this is a nine part series, and the first part is about the Silk Road. I'm uh, sorry, I'm hearing people joining in late. Uh, but this is about the Silk Road. We want to kind of go over that. In our conversations before, we talked about the Silk Road, or I mentioned the Silk Road, and it didn't seem like that many people really um, were aware of it. And because they weren't aware of it, I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to really talk about this project and talk about the significance that Kazakhstan has uh, in this project. Um, it's uh, it's very important, um, and if you don't know about it, I hope that this session will help you. I'm, I'm just I'm closing my screen real quick to let this last person in who just joined us. Okay. Okay. So the agenda for our conversation kind of rolls like this. Now we're about seven minutes in already. But I'd like to first talk about the sponsors, a little background information about uh, Masjid Muhammad. And I'm going to hand over to Imam Talib to do that, if that's OK. Um, and then a, a little bit about Coastal, who we are and what we're doing in the region. Uh, we'll try to stick to the schedule as much as possible. We might be off by five to ten minutes. Uh, then we'll go into the main presentation about the New Silk Road project. And I say AKA the BRI or AKA the OBAR. Um, just as we get into it, you'll understand New Silk Road has three names. Uh, New Silk Road was the first thing it was ever called. After that, it was called the Belt and Road Initiative. And then the One Belt, One Road Initiative. So you might hear the project be called BRI or OBAR. Um, then we'll kind of get into Kazakh's role, and it won't be a stopping point in between. We'll just roll into this and why Kazakhstan is the best place to access the new Silk Road, and specifically for black owned businesses. And then we'll get into QA and we'll try to get 15 minutes to QA um, just to focus on that. Otherwise, we'll be inside the presentation mode. Um, what I'm going to do when Imam Talib starts to present, I'm just going to go ahead and close this out and then. Um, I stop sharing my screen just long enough for, for Imam Talib to present, and then I'll open it back up afterwards. Uh, Imam Talib, can you leave giving us some information about Masjid Muhammad, about um, why this is of interest, um, so forth and so on? And you'll have to unmute Imam Talib.
Oh, Fitcher, go ahead, please. I had to take a call. Fitcher, you can go ahead. And... Sister Fitcher, you'll have to unmute. Assalamu alaikum again. Um, first, I want to uh, share with you that I've learned so much about Kazakhstan from Brother Farouk. Um, I actually uh, visited the embassy uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, as a pre um, rep to, uh, inshallah, joining the business delegation uh, to. Uh, visit Kazakhstan. Uh, Brother Farouk is uh, and Brother Imam Talib uh, have a, um, a long history together, um, and he is on the ground in Kazakhstan. He's one of our community members um, who has made great inroads um, there uh, regarding uh, uh, representation of, of of Muslim African Americans. Uh, 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 businesses doing business uh, abroad. Um, this is uh, a circumstance by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe, uh, has created for us um, in order that we become, we widen our um, uh, our opportunities. Uh, he has shown that he's going to be showing us over these nine uh, series uh, the opportunities in various different fields. As you know, Master Muhammad uh, is uh, in the nation's uh, in the nation's capital. We try to represent a broad approach uh, uh, in our reach and in our work for our national community. This is not just um, uh, opportunities for Masjid Muhammad. We look at this as opportunities for our national community that's doing business. We know that Imam Muhammad, may he be forgiven his sins and be in the highest place in paradise, said that he never worked, he would, he doesn't worry about us ever going back to the dark ages, but we need to become economically stable. And so this is, uh, uh, Brother Farouk is bringing us um some insight uh, uh through his experience on the ground on what is available to us brother Baruch, it's yours yes ma'am um thank you very much sister fitra and i have to also say that we're really looking forward to receiving this the the back side of this just in case anyone doesn't know um the purpose of doing these events is in order to prep people for a trip that will be in September uh, to come to Kazakhstan. Uh, we have brought several delegations here before and we're really looking forward to delegation. I got to embellish a little bit about Imam Talib for the people that don't know him. Imam Talib, in my opinion, and I think my opinion is very solid, is, is what I would consider to be the nation's Imam. Um, I mean, he's of course at the nation's mosque. Um, and I would say the nation's Imam because um, you know, who gives you authority to do what you do is important. Um, and we were told, um, I remember being in the military and I was told to um, elevate people and, and lower yourself. So I think Imam Talib, what he's doing, he's not elevating himself enough. So I got to do it for him. Um, you know, this was, uh, I give, give a really brief story. I was in the Coast Guard uh, 20, a long time ago. And you know, when I went in the boot camp, I told him this story several times. I, I went in the boot camp and they, we met with the uh, chaplain and the chaplain said, yeah, you know, we have this um, uh, guy in the military now. I hear they, they made a star and crescent just for him. You know, he's the first imam, this and that. And I was so excited because I thought he was telling me that he was on our base in Cape May, New Jersey. And um, when I got to the point where everybody got to go to the chapel during boot, I went and I was like, well, where's, where's, where is he? And he's like, no, 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 he's he's in another branch. He's not, he's not Coast Guard. And I felt so disappointed and dismayed that it was amazing. So the fact that Allah allowed me to meet the person who um, was such a, a strong individual that he was able to move a machine and a mechanism as big and as old as the military itself in order to accommodate a, an actual imam in the military is not a small feat. 
Um, and the fact that the White House sees necessary to bring him to almost every iftar, um, I just can't say enough about Imam Talib and about how privileged I feel just to even have him ask me to even participate at all with assisting in something that he sees as significant. And, and, and like I told Sister Fitra, we'll do our best, but um, you know we, we have our method our way, but in all honesty and truth, if Imam Talib just said, do it this way, Farouk, I would do it. Uh, it's, just, it's just that simple. Um, so that, with that being said, and I want to go in and give a little bit. I'm going to share my screen again. Yeah, I just want to say thanks, Ruby. I, I want to say you know you hurt me on that one just now. Oh, why? You know you hurt me, man. <laughs> we are, we good. We're intact. So I'm doing loud. Thank you. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. Uh, once again, I'm going to ask. In, in, make sure just nod ahead or either speak out. Can you see my screen? I just need one person to ch chime in. Hassan, can you see the screen? Yes, see we can it. see it. it looks good. It. And I'm going to start the presentation. Let me know you can see the presentation. Can you see the presentation and the agenda? Yes. Yes, Hassan. Okay. Yes, for real. So the we'll agenda is up. Why don't we go straight to the presentation because it's 10 20. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So just a little bit about Coastal really quick, though. Um, so first of all, we should know that the first Coastal is the first black owned enterprise in Central Asia. Um, there, of course, are other black people working in Central Asia, but they work for a company or they work for the government. Um, there are no black funded black owned enterprises in Central Asia except for Coastal. And we hold that as being the first. Uh, if there was some other ancient one, we don't know about them and they weren't documented. So we can take that claim. Uh, we are 100% black owned, uh, African American. I'm from Tuskegee, Alabama. Um, they're also, we are the first black open enterprise in Kazakhstan. And we are the only American developers on the Chinese border. That is black or otherwise. Um, we'll get into what that is and what the special economic zone is. But essentially, you should know that we are the only Americans that have been godfathered in because there was a ruling later uh, from the president to Kiev not to give certain foreigners access to the land in the free trade zone. Um, but our, 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 our arguments were godfathered and we got them in literally at the last moment. Um, so there won't be any other Americans allowed to build in that space. Um, one of our focuses here in Kazakhstan is to give heightened access for black owned businesses. Um, it was a heck of a task uh, there with the um, Kazakh ambassador in the United States. It was a heck of a task uh, to take a group of people who have no foundation in our color biases that we have in the United States, our racial biases, to understand the, 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 the significance and necessity to specifically invite African-Americans to Kazakhstan. Uh, I made the point over a couple of years and then I hammered down the point uh, with a couple of key people, including the prime minister. And we were very we were successful in having the president's investment committee, their chair, um, sign an agreement with Coastal that if we market it to African Americans, if we encourage African Americans to utilize Kazakhstan, then they would open up all doors for for African Americans, and we'll get into what all doors mean. But basically, there would be no limitations for African Americans. You get a red carpet because you come through, and we have that in writing in an actual four year agreement. Um, and we have a special, uh, what we call a special committee that we can call together at any time with all the investment heads, all of the heads of government from the Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and other ministries, in order to address specific issues that are related to bringing African-Americans and handling African-American businesses, including the way you are handled when you're here. Uh, so if you're here for three, four, five years, you have any issues, uh, we have the prime minister's ear, regardless of who changes out, in order to try to take our issues all the way up and ensure that our businesses are taken care of. And that's very important to know that we've prepared the ground uh, for it. We've uh, to date brought more African-Americans to Kazakhstan than have ever been brought in history. Um, and, we, and we've we brought almost 72, six, 72 people so far. Um, and we're looking forward to bringing 20 or more with uh, the delegation that will be led by Masha Uh One last note about Coastal is that we're located in the AIFC Autonomous Region. We'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. 
but the thing about the autonomous region is to know that we're inside this big, pretty building, uh, which circles around a ball that's like a dark Vader ball. And it's a really cool place to work. And I'm joking, but the, the reality is it is an amazing facility. Uh, it's a hidden jewel in Central Asia. Um, and like I said, we'll get into what's there and all the different parts and stuff like that later in the presentation. Um, but just know that this is what modern Kazakhstan looks like. It, it's not what you might think. And it's definitely, and I hate to even mention it, uh, any other um, uh, uh, movie representations you might have seen of Kazakhstan in a comedic way are totally false uh, when it comes to the country. So what we're here to talk about um, actually started in 2013. So in 2013, this part of our nine part series about why Kazakhstan will cover one of these, one of the major projects, not the, I should say one, the major project in the world. Um, it is the project of the century, which is the New Silk Road. Um, in 2013, um, President Xi Jinping actually came to Nazarbayev University in Astana, Kazakhstan, the city that I'm talking to you from now, and announced the reestablishment modernization of the New Silk Road. Uh, as we get into this presentation, you'll start to understand that all of the rhetoric that you hear, okay, I'm going to say rhetoric because I'm not going to say whether it's true or false. I'm just going to say it's rhetoric about China and their projects around the world are all tied to this single initiative. They are not separated. Um, China's presence in Africa, China's presence in the Middle East, China building anything inside towards the Philippines. All of this is a massively connected initiative. Um, and it has a single uh, kind of umbrella. It is in multiple pieces, as we'll find out as we go through it. But understand that the word, the New Silk Road is a common term. Like I said before, BRI or the Belt and Road Initiative or OBAR, uh, the One Belt, One Road Initiative is also um, another way to pronounce it. When I decided to come to Kazakhstan, I was doing research on this project. I understood that it was a part of our future that could not be ignored. And it was um, a, a kind of a video I'll watch. And when I watch the video online, as we do to do research, that preliminary research, the very first thing that I saw in the, the, the Chinese um, uh, TV documentary on the New Silk Road, the very first word out of the narrator's mouth was Astana, Kazakhstan. So I, I want you to understand it's not just us that understand Kazakhstan is important. It's also the heads of this project that understood that this was the first place that should ever been announced at. That's relevant. Uh, second to that, I want to kind of talk about the source of our information uh, so that you can also do follow up research when it comes to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this company, Refinitiv, I mean, we know some of the heads, but, you know, I have no ties to them. They just have good data. Uh, there is a report called the BRI Connect. Uh, initiative in numbers, and they have very good data about deal flow associated to BRI. Um, they have what we call a deal flow index and monitor. Uh, they also have very good information about each of the projects. There are thousands of projects under the BRI umbrella uh, and the spending and how they happen from year to year. They have some paid products, but this particular product is free and you can download it on the internet. And it, and it has a lot more data than what I'm gonna to present today if you wanna find out more about the uh, BRI or the New Silk Road. So getting to New Silk Road, uh, 2023, since 2013, 10 years in, um, we should understand the impact of the Silk Road. Now, my horrible squigglies over here represent the actual roads. And this is um, what you might find online, but it is a minuscule, minuscule representation of the scale of the Silk Road and it's on land as well as its maritime um, uh, um, 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 transport ways, right? So, tra or trade, trade, trade avenues. On the land, I have them in yellow. The maritime, I have them in purple. And then the blue are those that connect that are co-funded by the Chinese Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, and the African Development Bank. And a lot of people are not aware, but Africa is deep in the process of building corridors to connect the entire continent. Um, and there are several movements under the African Union, ECOWAS, um, that have to do with this. The one of the important thing to mention about 
Africa, because you know we're talking about black people, and I know one of the first questions when talking about Kazakhstan is why are we talking about Asia? Um, we have to understand that you know you have to get the knowledge of how to do things from somewhere. And while you're trying to get the knowledge to how to you know build the thing or get the machinery in order to jumpstart your industries, you have to also purchase from existing spaces. China has kind of positioned themselves as like kind of the go-to market of the world, but more importantly, um, they position themselves because of the attitude that they have towards manufacturing as a place where you can go grab knowledge on how to make something and then bring it back in. So. This kind of openness to Africa today, the Asian Africa thing is relevant. And of course, as Africa grows, uh, we do as Coastal, part of our initiative is to have more plans to do things in Africa. One of the things I want to point out is in East Africa, in Djibouti, uh, we'll get into a little bit later, but it's one of the things that you should look into with the Silk Road. Djibouti is the continent's first free trade zone. And I mean, absolute duty-free free trade. Anything that enters Africa through Djibouti, is, got, is has free trade through any road that you pass through and you pass through other agreements like the ECOWAS agreements, AFIDA, uh, other agreements that are there and those structures that allow for duty-free trade with inside the continent. So it's relevant to understand that, you know, Kazakhstan and the New Silk Road allows this opportunity to tap the knowledge of Asia and transport it into Africa as well. It's something I really want to point out uh, because I don't want anybody beating me up about, you know, uh, talking about Asia versus Africa. Eyes are on Africa, uh, but there are some segues that we have to pay attention to in the meantime. Uh, one of the things I understand about the impact of the Silk Road is that it is the mega project of the century. It's a $20 trillion project. And actual countries that have signed an agreement with China, signed an MOU, to say that they are part of this initiative and to open the door to investments, and, and um, uh, coordinated and collaborative projects, there are 138. Now, what's important to notice is there are 204, roughly 208 countries in the world. Um, the BRI is inclusive of 138, which covers 70% of the world's population. That's over 5.6 billion people. And it also covers 75%, 75% of the global GDP. That's 79 trillion US dollars. The, the, the countries together that are now connected through the BRI or through the New Silk Road um, are larger in their economy than any other country outside of it, together, collectively, including our own, uh, which is important to say. Uh, the globe, and and it goes back, I like to kind of say that it's not just a, a point that I made, it's a point that even President Obama made during his presidency that 95% of transactions in the world happen outside the United States. Uh, global energy resources, 75% of all energy resources are connected through the BRI. And there are some things that we won't talk about in this presentation, things that I'd like for you to research on your own, but they're like the China mega grid pro uh, um, um, uh, projects. There are other projects where, you know, mega grid, basically you can create energy anywhere in Central Asia, anywhere inside of Western China, anywhere towards the uh, Malaysia, whatever, and you can connect it into a single grid that will feed your electricity to most of Southeastern Asia, uh, which is an amazing concept. Um, also, one thing I want to mention about the New Silk Road that a lot of people don't know is that the New Silk Road is not just a road, uh, nor is it just a maritime lanes. Every single pathway has fiber optics, has other communication lines, and has other uh, uh, energy pipelines running alongside the roads and those tradeways. So they're not just extending how you transport and travel, they're also very much extending the infrastructure of the world and interconnecting um, Eurasia and Africa in a massive infrastructure connection. Um, that's, a, that's another conversation for another day. So one of the things I wanna kind of talk about is the scale of it and understand exactly where the money flows. You know, knowing the source of money and where money goes is really important. BRI spending, if BRI were a country, just like the, the project itself were a country, it would be the eighth largest economy in the world. And it would be bigger than Italy's economy, Brazil's, Canada's, or Russia's economy by itself. Just the project, not the country, just the project. And today in 2020, it's 5.2 trillion. There's not been new numbers cooked up since after COVID. Uh, that'll come out sometime later this year. 
But what's important is to understand that 44% of the investment has been in transportation. Like I said, those are roads, highways, and uh, infrastructure that goes in the roads. Power and water has been a humongous focus um, because one of the things that you know people don't know about building roads all the time, we don't think about it sometimes, is that when you're building roads, there has to be a lot to, 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 to support those roads. Um, so you got to have you know places to park your truck. And those places need electricity and water and the ability to fix the truck and get things going. Um, that's just one thing. Uh, there's also enormous amount of issues that have to be there. Also, there's work that needs to be done on the, on countries that are suffering from a lack of proper power resources in their grids or access to nice, clean and fresh water that would inhibit them from being good trade partners. And so it's important to understand that part of this project is bringing those countries out of that space so that they can be trade partners and participate in this large project. Real estate investments represent 18% and manufacturing, that's a misnomer, that's 4%, uh, excuse me, it's 9%, not 94%. That's a, a typo. So one thing that we also need to think about because as we start to talk about the BRI, um, and I'm not going to get into the politics and our geopolitics of the United States and China. That's not the point of this conversation. Um, what's more important is to deal with, will this actually succeed? Is it something that will actually work? Should you pay attention to it? Or is it just one more thing that might fail? Well, what's really important is that as of 2021, we, when you look at World Bank projects that are funded in the world, World Bank projects on average are 60 to 65% successful. And then after implementation, some 40 to 50% of World Bank projects will actually fail and the countries will be left indebted. So in comparison to the international averages for actually building projects, the BRI has been a powerhouse in the fact that 77% of its projects are active, 22% are complete, and literally such a small amount that you can't count have been canceled. Um, that's 35 projects in all. Uh, 1,989 projects are underway and 595 projects are um, completed, absolutely complete. Those are brand new roads, everything on your trip to Kazakhstan. I hope you make it. You'll see the road, these major, beautiful highways in the middle of nowhere, stretching from one length of the world to the next. Um, even when we go down inside of Kazakhstan, go to the border, you'll see there's a five mile, sometimes 10, 12 mile line of trucks that have driven all the way from Poland, driven from Germany, driven from other places in Europe into uh, the, border, the Chinese border because the roads have been done so well. Um, and there's also massive railway networks and other things that are there. So it's it's really, important to understand that this is something that's happening, that is already in motion, that is being successful in its implementation, regardless of any other rhetoric, every single year, trade along these lines increases. That is something that, that as I believe as black business owners, we are not always told because we're kind of in an information silo in the United States um, and we're fed information that's relevant um, to what we are wanted to be told. And in that space, sometimes we can't see what's really happening. And even though there are some very solid and justified um, arguments around BRI, we should know that the trade is increasing, that the initiative is actually working. Um, and we should not be jaded that it's something that will just go away uh, if we don't take advantage of being part of it. Uh, some of the projects that are, are in the BRI, so you can see the scale of it, things that you might not know. Uh, the trains that connect Mecca to Medina is part of the BRI project. Um, the light rail as well as the high-speed rail that goes through Mecca and takes the hajis from one space to the other. You, If you've made hajj over the last 20 years, you know those things did not exist before, and now they do. Uh, the dam in Ethiopia that has become a highly contentious point between Ethiopia and Egypt regarding the Nile, uh, that dam is set to be the largest dam on the planet Earth and will produce power and electricity for six countries in Africa, consistent six full countries, one dam. Uh, it follows the project that was done by 
uh, China, where they actually built a dam on the Yangtze River. It was at the time the largest dam in the world. And that dam was so powerful, so large that it was said to have slowed down the rotation of the earth by a very small degree. Um, the, the Ethiopian trains that are in Ethiopia that can take you now from Addis Ababa to Djibouti, which is very relevant, you know, not just for big business because it's a light rail project. Uh, it's, not, it's not a light rail project, but it's not a, a, a heavy cargo project is is meant to take people who grow their own food or their own produce or have another product that they make in Addis and they're landlocked and gives them access to the ports so that now they can go to the ports. And this is one of those projects where it was completely forgiven. So the entire debt to Ethiopia was forgiven. They have access to it. Cargos is in the top right corner and Sri Lanka is in the bottom, which has become one of the largest ports um, in the world. Sri Lanka port has been very, 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 very busy. Uh, and China's put a lot of energy into trying to, to do that. So one thing to, to that, like I said, a lot of us don't understand the scale of the project. It's not just roads. Um, it's not just uh, even infrastructure. I'm showing you some logistical elements, but there's another element to the BRI and it talks about the scale and the opportunities for black owned business. Um, you might think that the only opportunities are in merchandising and transportation, logistics, maybe building things along the road. Um, but there's something to be said that, and, and I, I really like to say this when the audience is, is partially or an all Muslim, look, Islam grew on the traditional Silk Road. If you map every Muslim country in the world, you'll find that they were attached to the original maritime or land Silk Road. Um, it was the major way that it got out. So it's to be said that culture also passes through the Silk Road. And modernizing this road means that a person with a certain method or methodology or a way of thinking or action, just like we're talking African-Americans now, will be able to easily travel between different cultures and spread the culture. So there are massive, massive cultural investments that are part of the BRI. For example, um, the Chinese company, Tencent, which is a huge company, just brought Universal Music Group this in 2020. They are the largest music group in the world, and they do include all of the works of Bob Marley, Stevie Wonder, you know, even Nicki Minaj, John Elton, um, and uh, Kendrick Lamar. I had to figure out, I'm not young enough to remember who that was in the corner, so I'm, I'm, I had to, but it's to know that these are all part of BRI investments now. So literally their music, what you hear is part of the BRI plan. So even the idea of spreading culture and more importantly, spreading our culture, our number one mechanism, of spreading our culture and our music throughout the world is literally a part of the BRI project already. And that is something really to think about and let's stew with exactly the scale of this and the impact of the project. So now we kind of get to the point where we say like, well, why Kazakhstan? What does Kazakhstan have to do with the BRI? Why is it important? Well, first of all, we should understand this. If you look at this map and you just center yourself right in the middle of the map, you'll understand that Kazakhstan is right in the middle of everything. It's not called Central Asia for nothing. It's also should be noted that Kazakhstan's not in the center of Asia. Let me say it again. Kazakhstan is not in the center of Asia. So why do we call it Central Asia? We call it Central Asia because we've always, you know, traditionally as people prior to colonialism, we call continents continents. We didn't separate continents because of political or racial uh, identification. So it would have been Africa and Asia. That's it. Not Eurasia, Asia. Europe decided to call itself Europe, but truthfully, it's Asia. And what's in the middle of Asia? Kazakhstan. Central Asia literally is the same distance from Japan that it is from London. You can fly from Astana, where I am now, to London in an overnight flight in six hours. You can fly from Astana to Tokyo in six hours or to Seoul, Korea. I didn't mark these here. You can fly to Beijing in five hours. You can fly to Turkey in four hours. You can get to the United Arab Emirates in just about four hours. And there is a four hour flight to Mumbai and a five hour, six hour flight to Thailand. 
And from those places, those hubs, you can go anywhere else in the world that you like. It's really important to understand that Kazakhstan is uniquely centered in the middle of it all. That that is why it's so important. That's why that you know China and, and the President Xi Jinping said, "Hey, I got to go here first because I can't get out unless I go through Kazakhstan, or else you have to go down here." And if you think about it, you know, trying to traverse through Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, hit the Caspian, run through Iran, come back through Azerbaijan, go through Georgia in order to hit Turkey. Not so easy. But if you go through Kazakhstan, you can go China, Kazakhstan. You do have to cross through Russia, the Ukraine, a little harder to do these days, but there are alternate routes now. They actually kind of go down through Georgia and come back up through Turkey. The, so there are new train lines being built now in order to usurp Moscow because a lot of the conflicts. Now that's another conversation. Uh, but either way, the quickest way to get into Europe, you can actually take a train from Kazakhstan all the way to France or to Frankfurt which is all the way up here this is for geographically challenged is inside of Germany. You can get there in 11 to 13 days. So you can put your things on a train and within 11 to 13 days by land, you can deliver things from one side of Asia to the other side of Asia, uh, to the other side of Asia or to Europe. And that's a very interesting concept. That's why Kazakhstan and it literally could not happen without Kazakhstan. Absolutely could not happen at all without Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is key for that and has always been key because of that. Um, a little bit more about Kazakhstan from a geopolitical standpoint is to understand the three big powers of the world, uh, Russia, China, the United States. We should refer to Kazakhstan as the Switzerland of the East. Donald Rumsfeld said that no part of the world become more rapidly significant than Central Asia. Now, what did he mean? He did a state visit during his tenure as Secretary of State and went into Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, and some of the other adjoining countries in Central Asia. What was very clear was that without access to Kazakhstan, the United States would be completely left out of the loop with anything that would happen in Asia in the future. It is a core element. It is so much so that and, you know there is a joint security, joint military agreement between the United States and Kazakhstan that was really exercised a lot in their agreements inside the um, turmoil in Afghanistan. A lot of the fuel, almost 80% of the fuel that was fueled to American military initiatives in Afghanistan came from Kazakhstan. Um, that's unrefined oil that came down or either refined uh, oil that, uh, excuse me, uh, jet fuel that came down in order to fuel the initiatives of the United States in Afghanistan giving access to the Caspian in order to push through Turkmenistan. Very humongous concept that the United States uh, maintains a very strong diplomatic mission here in Kazakhstan. And frequently, every single year since I've been here for five years, we've received the Secretary of State uh, inside of Kazakhstan every single year. Um, the largest border in the world between two countries is between Kazakhstan and Russia. Kazakhstanians speak Russian. We have another session on culture. We'll get into that at that time. But the idea that the Russian culture being part of the former USSR, now one of the CIS countries being part of the Eurasian Union means that Kazakhstan's ties back to Russia are very serious. Um, there are a lot of connections there, but Kazakhstan has shown in recent, like in the last year, two years, that they're willing to stand up and say, hey, I don't like what Russia is doing. We won't stand with you on the international stage, but at the same time still maintain a cultural an economic connection with Russia. This is a very interesting relationship um, that really can't be broken because there's no way to defend the northern border of Kazakhstan, none. So they must negotiate uh, in peaceful ways with Russia. Another very large border is, of course, the border they share with China. And we've already concert, you know, covered the idea they're the mouth of the Silk Road, right? If you want to push west in China, you want to get out the easiest way, we should understand that there's only two areas of, of leaving out. One is Kazakhstan and then Pakistan. But when you enter Pakistan, you'll have to go either the ground route um, or through Iran, uh, depending on what China wants to do. China is now vested in Afghanistan. So those 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 might be opportunities. But I don't think there's room for Americans in Afghanistan right now. Um, India has opted out of the BRI project. So India is not uh, open to be accessed by China's western border to get out, 
Bhutan has also opted out of almost any international programs. Uh, they don't want to be involved. So they, so that is very important about the logistics. And because of this relationship between China, Russia, and the United States, there has to be negotiations for peaceful interaction at all times. And the Kazakhstani diplomats are actually extremely skillful in making sure that they maintain all three of these things. And also in the plan of the country, the culture, and like I said, we'll get into culture later, but as they integrate cultures, they're very intelligent about which parts of the culture they promote and, and they balance it with Islam, they balance it with a little bit of Westernism, they balance it with Russian methodology, they balance it with a little, little taste of China, not a lot of it, just a little taste of it. Um, and, and it's a really amazing thing to, to, to see. Brother Farouk, I, I just wanna say it's 10.50. Uh, I want to encourage uh, those who are on the line to begin to put their questions in the chat box so that you can begin to, because you've given a lot of valuable information, so you can begin to answer some of those questions. And also, Imam Talib uh, does have another meeting, and, and so I wanted to make sure he has an opportunity uh, if he needs to address uh, of this audience before he leaves yes ma'am we only have two more slides we're at the end okay uh, real, real quick i want to give you some terms that you can kind of look up uh, about the belt and road initiative in, in reference to kazakhstan i mentioned cpec one of the things that you know about cpec you should look this up it's a chinese pakistan economic corridor that stretches from china through through pakistan through the port of Gwadar. the port of Gwadar, outside of the port of karachi a, once you leave out of there, you can get to any of the Middle Eastern ports in a day. You can get to the African ports in three days. Um, so it puts Kazakhstan literally just a drive, a ride, and a, and a short boat ride from those different spaces. Cargos, um, and we'll get into this later, but it's a free trade on the border of China. And it's not just free trade for big guys. It's free trade for everybody who can make it through. As you see with the pictures here coming through the border, people do transactions daily by the thousands in cargos. And it is a wonderful space. It's here, it is the mouth of the free of the of the of the uh, Silk Road as well. Uh, one last thing I want to cover just really quick is about Kazakhstan and kind of doing business in Kazakhstan is access to the special zones and the special privileges that come with that. Uh, first of all, is a five-year visa. I need to say that there is absolutely nowhere in all of Asia, nor have I been able to find somewhere in Africa either that will issue you a five-year visa from the day that you register your business in, in, in the country. Kazakhstan does that for you inside the special economic zones that we work out of. No tax on foreign workers. So if you bring people from the United States or other countries to work in, you can extend them five-year visas to work with you and they will not be taxed by the local taxes. Low cost, typically our costs inside Kazakhstan are 25% on labor, 25% less on your living costs, 40% uh, less, and your regular day-to-day -day costs are usually 10 to 15% of that in the United States. And last but not least, there are free programs where there's free land to build and do projects throughout Kazakhstan. And those are open to certain foreigners by working through a certain way. It's a little hard than it was before, but it's definitely open. And that's a good reason why it's Kazakhstan. That is the presentation. And I'm, I, it was a lot of information to give. And I apologize about us being run a little bit late. I do want to say thank you. And I do want to close this out. And I want to hand over to my team, I'm Talib, because he has another meeting and make sure that we can gain his comments. So uh, thank you again, brother, for really appreciate that presentation. This is the first one of a series of this partnership or this delegation. Uh, that we have planned for September. Uh, we know we have many on, on this uh, webinar. There'll be many uh, coming on in, in the future. Uh, if you want to be a part of the delegation, again, Sister Pitcher is our lead, uh, working in, in, in uh, concert with our brother Farouk. Uh, you see he's in a very strategic location. And of course, we see he has accepted as part of his destiny uh, to help connect us as African-Americans specifically, and others too that's in America, uh, to something that Allah has put us in, in, in place to also to embrace. Uh, we have to broaden our circles. We have to broaden our circles. Uh, and this is an opportunity to see that. And, and again, uh, America was the first country in the world to recognize Kazakhstan's independence. That tell you how, how, how quick they jumped on it and what they saw 
uh, about how strategic they were, and you heard a lot of a lot of that uh, as well. Business, business is very important. You know, get your share. You got to have business opportunity. It's difficult to have ec uh, political dignity if you don't have economic dignity, uh, and this will help us to do just that. Uh, Majority of this trip is really for business, as we're hearing right now. This is important for us, important for our future uh, as a people. Uh, there's going to be a cultural element, and of course, we're Muslim and we're American. Uh, so obviously, we will represent America too. We will have some opportunities to meet with also the uh, uh, the ambassador and other things, as as Farouk mentioned as well. And he, and again, he's done a. We thank Allah for what Allah has opened up to him for putting him in a place that's so strategic to to the world. Uh, and, and please don't succumb to the politics uh, that that can that can mess people up. It's like into the politics. Uh, all of this has to do with uh, the, the picture of the world. You know, we have to broaden our perspective. You know, Allahu Akbar, again, he said he's bigger so we can always broaden our vision to go bigger than just to think about just America. You see, there's a whole globe. People are looking at this whole piece. That's why they just had a G7 meeting. They just going to be meeting again. They, they, they're looking at the whole globe, not just a small piece, but everything connects. The Silk Road connect livelihoods, connect people, progress people. And again, so we're just going to help us to broaden uh, and be more effective uh, as we begin to uh, embrace our sacred destiny uh, as a people as well. So thank you for really appreciate it. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, we look forward to the other ones that are coming up. Please uh, go ahead and get to the questions. Yes, sir. Thank you, Imam. Uh, so I don't have any questions coming up from James inside of the chat. So what I'll do is we are at 10:55. Oh, here we have one here. Uh, can, can you comment on the dynamics between Saudi Arabia and Kazakhstan? Well, that's an interesting one. Um, I don't have a lot to give you, but I will tell you that the relationship between Saudi Arabia, uh, more importantly, the GCC countries, um, and Kazakhstan is persistent and consistent. Um, there was a delegation from Kaz Invest that went out to Saudi Arabia uh, early this year and signed agreements. Um, I think they signed 11 agreements, uh, all economic related um, around investment from Saudi Arabia into uh, Kazakhstan. Um, I, are you are you looking for an answer from an economic standpoint? Are you looking for an answer from a cultural standpoint? Um, Brother Sajad? And feel free to open your mic. Uh, so, so, so like I'm sorry, uh, for the follow -up. thank you for taking the question. I was, I'm more interested in business and investment, which, which obviously would lead to economic as well. So I'm just trying to understand that dynamic. Understood. So, it, so it, there is a, a, a good correlation. I will tell you that there's constant conversations from the investment committee under President Takaya with Saudi Arabia, with Qatar, with some of the GCC countries when it comes to investment. They maintain extremely good ties. Um, Islamically is culturally different uh, a lot, but the connection is, is clear and there's a lot of work that's being done in that area. Exactly what those vectors and those industries are, if you want to know more information about it, please uh, just send me a message through any of the channels, LinkedIn or otherwise, and I'll, I'll answer them those specifically. Yeah, we'll be we'll be in touch, inshallah, on LinkedIn. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, any anyone else? Feel free to open your mic. We're like we have another. I'm willing to extend another five to ten minutes, but feel free to open your mic and ask your question di directly. Or please, it's actually better if you put it in the chat. But uh, thank you, Farouk. I appreciate the presentation. I see you have other presentations coming, and I may have missed it. I'm trying to get down to the question. I'm sorry. Uh, but briefly, what immediate business opportunities do you see for small companies? And what is the average investment and business type structure that you see as being most successful in the BRI initiative? Well, you know, it's very open. I mean, that's why I went through the extreme of showing that there are actual investments in culture and music that are happening and placing that throughout. You know, it's an it's a humongous development and you really do have to put your, you know, like really big hat on in order to think of the dynamics. But if you want to narrow into the small areas, what you should think about is two different angles. One, what works in the plate in the United States that they don't have somewhere else? That's the typical bag to dig in and figure out what works. The second bag that you can work in is what does the United States need from the area that I can sell? That's really important that I can sell, that I know I have an avenue for being able to sell. 
I have an offload a mechanism that's there. And then you look, it's so very, very, very open. Um, in Kazakhstan, you can go down to Uzbekistan and, and source cotton from the source. The best hand-picked cotton in the world is from Uzbekistan, right? So you can do responsible source in Uzbekistan, pull it up and you can do shirts, you can do blankets, sheets. Um, we have we have two people right now doing sheets and pillowcases and we have another person doing uh, t-shirts that are coming from Uzbekistan and we are accessing that through Kazakhstan. Um, I, I could just name an endless amount. What I would say is, Please join us for the rest of the events. In all of the um, posts, there's a list of every date of each event, and we're covering certain vectors. And we'll get into detail about that particular vector, and then we'll answer very specific questions about how to access the opportunities in that vector. Um, I don't see anyone posting any other questions. Hey, for real, uh, can, 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 can you just briefly? I know you're going to get into the culture in the next piece, but since this is the first one, can you just, and we're Muslims, can you just briefly speak about the population of Muslims and just, and just the history real brief, the Islamic history? So the, 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 as far as the Islamic history of Kazakhstan, I will say that um, here, one of the best ways I have to explain this is like when we're in the United States and, you know, I don't know a lot of us, we don't know that there's a thing called the Mashad of the Bosniaks. In the U.S., there, there, there are several Mashal Bosniaks. I mention that only to say is that we probably will never venture into them. There is a a, a significant difference on how uh, people in CIS countries practice Islam, and it's because of the impact that was given. Kazakhstan. What we should understand about Kazakhstan is a first of all, they've been Muslims in Kazakhstan since the time of Rasulullah We should understand that. We should understand that, you know, I, like a, a little bit of history, I like to get into the Umayyad Khalifa that was led by, you know, some of the bad guys, you know, they were taken over by the Abbasid Khalifa, but they were taken over by the Khalifa because they connected people in the steppe. They connected all these different cultures in the steppe to fight out. So Islam in this area is very old, so old that it's completely trenched and completely drenched into the culture and unseparable. However, when the USSR formed itself, and I'm not like I like Imam Tom said, I don't get into politics of it because there's a lot of opinions around a lot of things, but they formed themselves uh, with this heavy hand of fighting back in World War II. One of their methodologies was to basically get rid of all differences between the people in the USSR. So the idea was you're only Russian. That was the idea. So they took 10,000 Imams. Preachers, they were not specific to Islam. Preachers, Imam, agnostics, they lined them in the street and they shot them in the back of the head. Then after the Russians did that, they burned the churches and they burned the mosques and they burned the Qurans and they burned the Bibles. And then they made it illegal to pray. If you if your neighbor said, I saw Borjan over there with a, with a, with a uh, and by the way, your name couldn't be Borjan. You had to take on a Russian name. Right. So if your name was Ali, you had to change it to Alan and you couldn't name your baby's Muslim name. So, you know, if you saw Alan praying in his house, you could call. They would take him to jail, beat him up really bad. Maybe he'd make it home. Um, if 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 you were at your mother's funeral and I've had people actually say this and you lifted your hands up like this, you could go to jail at your mother's funeral. So it was that bad. 1989, when the country got independence from Russia, the president Nazarbayev at the time, he put a, the first president of Kazakhstan, uh, the new Kazakhstan, he put a lot of energy in the rebuilding mosque and reestablishing the seat of the Grand Mufti and everything. During the Russian occupation, there were Kazakhs that were like monks. They went into the caves. They hid for two generations and hid the entire history of the Kazakh people away from the Russians. They then brought those books out during independence and made them a national treasure. And then they implemented them where they started to say, how do we put our culture back, which is completely interlaced with Islam. So you do have 112 different types of people in Kazakhstan, even though I always say they all look the same, but you do have 112 different cultures in Kazakhstan. You have Tatar, you have Uyghur, you have Dengani, you have Kazakh, 
but the Islam that's here is one where it's a general concept of Islam. Even if a guy might be sitting, I've had this happen to me before. Uh, salam alaikum, brat is the word for brother. Salam alaikum, brat. Wa like, alaikum salam, bratan. Baka. <laughs> it happens here. There's a the, when the mosque was first built, a lot of people just walked to the steps. They didn't even know they could go inside. They just bowed on the steps and walked away. They had so little information about Islam. This year, the government has reinstated advertising to the people the benefits of wearing hijab. This year, this year, right? And these are things that I think we can uniquely add to the culture is how to mix European culture with Islam to the point where it's still good Islam, but you can still be hip. And they can take on that modernism that the young people want. But that's how Islam is here. It is beautiful. I, I'll add this last piece. You don't worry about your daughters. You don't worry about your wife. You don't worry about your sisters here. Nobody stares them down. Nobody approaches them inappropriately. No, nobody. I don't care how pretty they are. I don't care how different they are. I've got four, I've got three, two daughters here and my wife. They've never been approaching a bad way, ever, five years. And that's just one of the things that is innate in the people. And if you connect with people on Islam here, they'll connect even if they're not praying people. And you can always encourage them to do better and they, they really will see the necessity to do so. I, I see, Brother Farouk, that on 6-1, you will be discussing the culture uh, in uh, Kazakhstan. So you've just given us a, a nice broad view and, and, and I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm sure the audience is excited to hear what else you could share. Uh, so we want to invite everyone back on June 1st at 10 o'clock a.m. using the same link. Brother Imam, were you going to say something else? I'm, I didn't oh, no, I, did, I have to jump now, but I think greatly appreciate it. I, I see a lot of faces I haven't seen in a while and looking forward to connecting. Thanks you again, Brother Baruch. Greatly appreciate it. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Live I do want to answer one last question before we go, before we end the conversation. We are six minutes over. I said I would stay at 10. Um, there's a question about where the webinars will be recorded and available for later. Yes. Um, so all the webinars will be held in the Google Meet. I was going to push it live, but I think it's better that we keep it in the nice little group. Everybody can talk and see who each other are. And then we'll distribute it uh, afterwards. But we'll distribute it on all channels. It will be on LinkedIn. It will be on Facebook. Um, it'll be on our websites. Uh, it'll also be on Masha Muhammad. Masha Muhammad, I think, posted on their website as well. Yeah. well you, it, send it to us and we'll post it. Yes, ma'am. And it'll also be on our YouTube channels. And those YouTube channels I'm referring to are the Voice of Freedom, Freedom Nation. This is part of our Freedom Nation platform. Uh, probably the last thing I want to say before we get off is just a little bit about us and that we are a movement that is a company that is organized around black power, around giving the ability to black owned businesses and black people from the United States of America, the ability to access the world and access peace and prosperity in every single place they touch. Coastal is a, is a fully owned subsidy of the GNS Coast Support Service. GNS Coast Support Services is the solution for Freedom Nation. We do all the work for them, the professional work. Um, that is part of the platform. We're very happy. I'm gonna let Sister Fitcher in, and I'm gonna say thank you to Masha Muhammad for opening up the opportunity for us to have this conversation and to put this back out to our people. For some people, I know it's the very first time you're hearing this information, so please research. Feel free to message me about anything you wanna know, and I will pass you to awesome resources uh, so that you'll have them. I see uh, Brother Tahiti has his hand up. We want to recognize uh, if he has a question. Brother Tahiti, and it is 11.08. We want to respect people's time, so we want to end this, uh, if possible, after his question. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Fruit. That was a very exhaustive, concise cons uh, presentation. I just had, uh, Imam had mentioned that the trip is in September. Yes. Have the dates been changed, and what are those dates? They are, they are, the dates have not been confirmed yet, but yes, September is the target month at this time that we're discussing. All right, okay. and, and, and Brother Tawhidi, I need to say that we're doing that in consideration of trying to reduce the air costs. Exactly. Right. Okay. It will be, I will tell you that it will be after September 15th, uh, but the dates, uh, we will, the dates will be uh, discussed and confirmed, inshallah, this week. Okay, great. That's all I had. Thank you, Brother Tahiti. Um, Brother Farouk, if you, uh, you know, 
uh, it's 11.09. I'm ready to close out. I don't see any other questions. Um, and you can have the last word and if we can close out. Okay, last word is to our brother Lynn Mosley up top. Uh, he, he was one of the first people to actually put into one of these trips to Kazakhstan. He sent his queen over here and I hope that we did our best to take care of her and show, show love. Everyone should know that you know our intention for receiving you is to receive you as family. Um, and we have two of our freedom citizens here will tell you that we do everything we can to facilitate our people and treat them as family. Uh, we do everything that we possibly can. So we are looking forward to anyone who's willing to make the trip. I encourage you to do so. It will be something new. Uh, there will be hidden little nuggets that aren't written down anywhere that you will talk about for the rest of your entire life. I guarantee. So maybe, um, so maybe on June first, uh, when we talk about the cultural piece, uh, he can sh give. We can give him a couple of minutes to share his experience with us. Um, just since he was on the ground. But again, if you have any questions, you want to receive the travel package once it's um, completed, uh, please send your email to admin at the nationsmos.org and we will make sure uh, that you get uh, information on travel. Brother Farouk, if that's it, uh, it's 1110. Why don't we yes, close? Okay. So, so we're closing like I always do. I say, Asalaamu Alaikum. Goodbye, good night, good day, Uhuru. That, yes, people need to know that it's 10 yeah. hours. You're 10 hours <laughs> ahead of I'm us. going to eat. I'm going to eat. All right, good night, everybody. Have a good day, everybody. Okay, how do I...